I am your host, Jack Eid, and it is my honor, honor to welcome our guest, Rosanna Shaw, environmental reporter with the Los Angeles Times and author of California Against the Sea. Welcome to Eco Justice Radio. Hi, Jack. Hello there. Uh, well, Rosanna, you have written this amazing treatise on the struggle that the 1,200 miles of California Pacific Ocean coastline will be facing as sea levels are rising as a result of global heating and melting of glaciers. Well, you, you begin the book telling what is essentially the Rainbow Bridge creation story from the Chumash people uh, who originated in the Channel Islands off the Santa Barbara Ventura coast. Can you tell us that story and how it set the tone for your entire book? Yeah, thank you. It, it means a lot to hear that you connected with the opening of the book. I mean, you know, when I first heard the Rainbow Bridge story, I knew in my heart immediately that this needed to be the beginning of the book. You know, I was reflecting on sea level rise with a member of the coastal band of the Chumash Nation. And she and I, we were just kind of riffing and reflecting on the past, you know, as it pertains to our present and the future. And she in reintroduced this story, the Rainbow Bridge story to me as not just a beautiful creation story that has captivated her since childhood, you know, but also she presented it as an oral record, you know, possibly the first record ever of sea level rise along the California coast. And, you know, the, the crux of the story documents the ebbs and flows of the tide and how the Channel Islands grew and shrank in size as sea levels changed before and after the Ice Age and how the Chumash people moved in rhythm with these changes. And so as an environmental writer, you know, I, I'm often thinking about, you know, what and who we value as expert, you know, beyond Western science and lawyers and historians with PhDs, you know, where does indigenous knowledge like this Chumash story fit in? And can indigenous knowledge be presented equally and in conversation with Western science and our understanding of the world. So, so these are things that I'm constantly thinking about as a storyteller and also just kind of how we share power and how in the stories that we tell and the information and the data and the expertise that we present. And, you know, in this case, here is a story that is thousands and thousands of years old, a, a story that matches the geologic record. And it also provides a different, you know, more reciprocal way of thinking about our relationship to the ocean compared to you know, how we've built up and settled the coastline as we know it today in the last 200 or so years. And you know, just thinking about all of this just really clicked for me. And it just, this story felt like the right way to begin this book about the California coast, you know, past, present, and future. Yeah, reciprocity is, is an important, so you know, as we're integrally, integrally linked with the natural environment and you know, we, we have to start acting like that. And so we're going to cover that more. I'm, I'm particularly struck by, by the notion you put forward that the line between aquatic and terrestrial is ever changing and the two systems are forever intertwined. And can you expand upon this? Yes. I mean, I mean, the coast itself is fascinating, right? It's the it's the very edge where land meets ocean and there is an inherent and, and there is an inherent tension between land and sea, but it's also kind of, there's this dance and someone was saying the other day, like, it feels like the marriage of the two and that, you know, so, and, and beyond all that, I mean, so often when I talk to people today, like so many people still think about the coast, think of the coast as static, like a place that doesn't move as a place that we visit, you know, and we recreate on and we go to the beach and we expect it to be the same every time we go back. But the beach itself is actually, a process, you know, and it, it is this dance and marriage between land and ocean. And I would say I was also guilty of thinking about the coast as more of a static place when I first moved to California, but it can truly be mind expanding to start just thinking about the coastline as an ever moving line in the sand, you know, rather than as something that we can fix in place and expect to be there forever. And, and, you know, the thing is the coast is meant to change, right? You know, our built environment has blinded us to this very basic truth. But if you stand on the beach for one afternoon, really slow down and pay attention and look at the tide line, that tide line 
is different every time the wave crashes onto shore, right? And and, the, and this line in the sand, and I, I use this term a lot, you know, this line in the sand, so to speak, is not supposed to be fixed. Yet we've tried to impose permanence onto this inherently impermanent landscape, whether it's with Pacific Coast Highway or seawalls or entire neighborhoods built right on the sand. And that's truly at the heart of this conflict that we're having and we're facing right now in terms of what it means to face sea level rise going into the future. Yeah, it's we've we've gotten ourselves into a massive problem here, and and it is really, you know, sea level rise. How's it going to look? I mean, a lot of people don't really think. Well, they think, well, it's it's a lot worse if you're on the Pacific Islands or even on the East Coast. It's much worse. California, it's not so bad. What is what's California looking for? Looking can they look forward to at the coast, as well as how is this an effect of our global climate crisis? Yeah, I mean, sea level rise is both a global issue and also a micro issue for every community that is living on this edge between land and ocean. And I mean, a couple of thoughts here, you know, first on a very, very, very high level, I find it helpful to remind folks that sea level rise in many ways is the heart of climate change. I mean, we focus so much on carbon emissions on land and, you know, air and air quality and stuff like that. But but the ocean has absorbed more than 90% of the excess heat from the excess carbon emissions that we have emitted since the industrial Absolutely. revolution. Absolutely. The ocean is a huge producer of the oxygen that we breathe in this world. And so, you know, put real simply, the ocean is getting hotter as a re- direct result of all of the excess carbon emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere. And warm water expands and takes up more space and takes up more volume. And so as the ocean is getting hotter and hotter every year, we are starting to increasingly feel the consequences of all that excess heat that the ocean has been containing for us in the form of sea level rise along our shores. And so, you know, if you zoom into California and look at the numbers, and this is where I kind of cringe because numbers only tell some of the story, right? And like, as a storyteller, I often tell students, People don't necessarily remember data points. They remember how they feel when you talk to them about, you know, the the meaning behind the data. But just, you know, to step back and really just lay out some of the key data points, it's really sobering. We're looking at six, possibly seven feet of sea level rise in California by the end of the century. And, you know, that, of course, will translate somewhat differently depending on where along the coast you're situated. Um, But this like six to seven foot projection is supposed to give you like a broad sense of what we're facing in California. And you know, what does that mean? So there was a big USGS study a couple years ago that found that more than $370 billion in property could be at risk of coastal flooding by the end of the century wow. along California. And from an ecological standpoint, we're looking at, you know, more than two thirds of our beaches in Southern California completely drowned out by end of century if we continue business as usual. And there was also a really sobering study uh, fairly recently that just looked at wetlands along coastal wetlands along the Pacific coast from Washington all the way to Baja and Pacific coast salt marshes could go completely extinct as an entire ecosystem by end of century if we continue to allow this coastal squeeze to happen if we continue to just move forward again this term business as usual but you know without shifting course and you know to bring things a little bit closer to home than end of century because that's something I feel a lot of folks in the science and policy space has been kind of reflecting on. Beyond what like still feels kind of abstract, 2100, you know, if we look at the projections now for even just the 2030s, we are looking at a lot more intense flooding at higher frequencies and kind of this recurring nuisance flooding and recurring extreme flooding. And I, I think kind of shifting our mindset to thinking about the frequency of something that will happen as early as the next decade and also in the now. There's also been a lot more focus on switching our policy and planning from 2100 to 2050 and 2050 is you know less than 30 years from now. And so for example, in California, more than a dozen state agencies recently agreed that the goal should be to prepare as many communities as possible for three and a half feet of sea level rise by 2050. So I know I just threw a bunch of numbers at you, but I think you know we went from thinking about projections at the end of the century, which feels pretty apocalyptic. We've shifted it now to like 2050, and then even just kind of what it looks like next year and the next few years, we're really facing a lot more frequent 
high tide flooding and storms and just a confluence of truly the water moving back in. And we do have a lot of really intense questions to face in terms of how do we respond to that? Absolutely. And, and so this battle metaphor, this war metaphor, uh, a lot of people might think that, okay, well, what you're outlining here gives us even more reason to, to feel warlike. We have to go to war against the, you know, the sea, the waves, the storms, the winds. How are we going to win? Well, we cannot win that battle. And we, We've, we've shown the, the trouble that we're in already without sea level rise, all the difficult things going on on the coast. We need to figure out how to start collaborating with these forces. You cover well in the myriad of places and communities you surveyed in the book this, this concept of, of trying to work with, you know, in, in fits and starts sometimes. But you referenced the creative nonfiction writer, John McPhee, who was an influence on me as an environmental uh, student. And his He's essay, a legend. Yeah. Uh, his essay, Los Angeles Against the Mountains, is an inspiration for your title. Uh, can you tell us how that inspired you? Yeah. So Los Angeles Against the Mountains is one of my favorite John McPhee essays, and it's nested within a series called Control of Nature. And this idea of controlling nature is of an era, right, in terms of our relationship to the environment. And this notion that we can control nature is, you know, truly a very, a modern and Western notion. And it's funny, you know, you talked about the word reciprocity earlier. That is a huge theme in my book and kind of can't, this question of can we reshift our relationship to the ocean and to nature and to the environment in a way that feels more reciprocal than, you know, a relationship that feels more like we are at war with the ocean and at war with nature. And I've been thinking a lot too, as a writer about the words that we use to talk about climate change. I mean, even something as innocuous as the fight against climate change is implicitly implying that we are at war, we're at battle, we are fighting something. And, you know, what does it mean to work with nature? And so Los Angeles against the mountains, I mean, it is such a evocative title. California against the sea is directly inspired by that. My title is guilty of the warlike metaphors that we use to talk about our relationship to nature. I I would I, I do hope that by the time you finish reading the book, you know, California against the sea is where we start the book, but it's not ultimately where we end that journey. But, you know, California with the sea and California and the sea isn't as evocative of a title. So that got no, nixed. But yeah, and California. Got, <laughs> and we're not there yet. But I do hope we're a little bit closer to that possible alternative future that we could be, you know, moving towards by the the book shows the path forward or at least some paths and possible paths forward. But Absolutely. ultimately, this ultimately this idea of being against the ocean. I also like the play on words. I mean, California literally is against the edge of the ocean. But yeah, I mean, we do tend to be stuck in these notions of walling ourselves off against the ocean, fighting the ocean, fighting climate change, fighting sea level rise. And a lot of it is due to the way we've structured our built environments and how we are choosing to live within nature and within these landscapes today. And a lot of it's also embedded in the way we talk about it. And so, you know, I can't fix climate change, but I can definitely think about the ways we talk about it and, you know, present alternative language and wording in terms of how we can choose to relate to our surroundings. Yeah, I, I would give the counterpoint, uh, and we're going to cover the California Coastal Commission later, but a lot of these uh, discussions about different projects do come down to fights. So, <laughs> yes. so it, it may be an apt metaphor in certain situations. Um, so what I want to do, we're going to mix together some of your case studies as with some of the solutions and non-solutions and difficult problems. So we're going to sort of go back and forth between that. Uh, your first case study that you sort of start the book off is Imperial Beach. Uh, it's on the San Diego border with Mexico, uh, right across from Playa de Tijuana. Uh, there's a lot of pollution coming down that that uh, Tijuana River. There's also these amazing wetlands out there. Um, they stretch for miles, and it, it, it's got lots of high surf, untreated sewage, border town. Uh, tell us about what's going on down there. 
Yeah, I really wanted to make sure this book went to places that also felt less obvious. I mean, you pick up a book about the California coast and, you know, people will think of Malibu, they'll think of Santa Monica, San Francisco, Santa Barbara. But what about, you know, these more working class towns that also call the coast home? And so Imperial Beach, it's a border town. It's surrounded by water on three sides. You know, one fifth of the town is lower income. And Imperial Beach is fascinating to me in a number of ways. I mean, a couple storylines kind of emerged the more I got to know the community. But I guess what I'll say here is that Imperial Beach is, it's working class. It hasn't fully gentrified. And I think it's, the community is kind of at this place where they're faced with a couple different paths into the future. One, you know, and there, you know, if you talk to a certain cohort of folks in the community, one path is to continue gentrifying, to continue down this path of like hoping to be like Laguna Beach one day, to have fancy hotels and mega million dollar mansions on the water. And another path is to kind of acknowledge that so many, so much of the wetlands are retained in Imperial Beach. You know, there is a lot of accommodation already for the ocean and the ocean is continuing to move in. And how, how can you develop and maintain affordable housing and to serve a community that is a lot more mixed income? How do you build more intentionally into the future, acknowledging rising water while also kind of living in better harmony with it? And so there's a little, there's definitely some competing desires and interests in this community on what the future should be. But I think Imperial Beach represents such an interesting snapshot of like a place that still has the choice to develop a different way to grow and nurture and support their community in a more resilient and more sustainable way, rather than to continue down the path that so many other communities along the coast have already locked themselves into. But yeah, it's it's truly fascinating. And it, it also felt like a good place to begin this almost road trip up and down the coast as we explore Absolutely. what it means to confront sea level rise. Yeah, and and it's it's definitely it sets off the tone of a conundrum that you know there's no easy answer here, but uh, we we need to start coming up with as many answers as possible as soon as possible. Um, so, just can you tell us? about seawalls as a way for homeowners, restaurants, harbors, roads to mitigate that oncoming water and the power of the ever-changing sea. What happens when we build a wall in the way of the rising tide? Yeah, and what you just said about options. I mean, it's when I first started writing about this issue, I mean, I wanted to find the solution, right? And you know, the very quick answer is there's no silver bullet right, right. to sea level rise but everywhere I went people would present to me like all these different ideas and all these different solutions and at one point I kind of really stepped back and read through all, all my notes sorted through kind of and processed everything that I was learning and you you can basically essentially categorize put every solution into a couple categories you know one option is to build a seawall another option is to you know, they're called it's called sand renourishment, but basically truck in sand from somewhere and to continue to pad out the beach and the coastline in perpetuity in response to the rising ocean to keep your beach as wide as sandy as possible with outside sand. The third option is managed retreat, which I know we'll, we'll talk a lot about, but it, that's, you know, relocating away from the water as the water moves in. And then, you know, the fourth ish option is to elevate, to, you know, build your house on stick uh, on stilts elevate an entire road, build more bridges. You're seeing a lot of that on the East Coast. I think in California, it's going to be a little bit trickier with our geology. So I haven't really heard the elevation part as much, but the idea of that a seawall, beach replenishment, or manage retreat are kind of essentially the three broad categories of responses. And to go back to your question about seawalls, seawalls tend to be the gut instinct response. It's also the easy political win. You know, the ocean is moving in, I'm going to build a wall to wall off the ocean. I think the long-term question is how big of a wall do you need to build and maintain in order to fend off the largest ocean on this entire planet? And I think a lot of communities are truly confronting finally, like what that true cost will be. And the other, un the other kind of cost that is not monetary 
to seawalls is that, you know, one environmentalist actually just put it to me super bluntly, seawalls kill beaches. You, the minute you start fixing this line in the sand, you harden the shoreline and the coastline cannot migrate inland as the ocean is moving inland. What happens is everything in front of the seawall gets drowned out. You know, the the water moves in, it goes up, it keeps hitting against the wall, all of the sand completely gets washed out in front of the wall. And then I'm sure many folks have kind of seen this effect along their beaches, where if you see like a pile of boulders or like a concrete seawall or road, the ocean moves in and it can't move past that hardened line in the sand. It keeps carving away at the sand. So it creates this very steep slope against the wall and it just completely alters the natural processes along the shoreline. And so yeah, I've never been able to unhear that quote, you know, seawalls kill beaches, because essentially, by hardening the shoreline, we are disrupting the natural replenishment and flow of sand along our beaches. Absolutely. So um, thank you for that. And we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be getting back to all this fun that's happening on our California coast. Okay, so we're back with Rosanna Shah. And so you also write about the town of Capitola on the Monterey coast. The joke is it is sometimes called Capitola by the sea, and maybe one day it will be Capitola in the sea. <laughs> Can you tell us about the cliff stabilization project you discussed from there? And what about environmental justice issues that are related with the rising seas in that area? I have actually not heard that joke before. Wow. I mean, from a morbid perspective, too. I mean, so Capitola, the colorful homes, the Venetian Hotel right on the beach is actually on the cover of the book. And I will say when the book cover got designed and lay at, laid out and we were sending it to the printer, those homes had not gone underwater yet. It was merely because the homes were so iconic and felt very quintessential coastal California that our book designer gravitated towards it in terms of including it on the book cover. But then in January 2023, the homes completely became like they were flooded. The debris from the ocean like just washed completely across that complex. And at one point, it was like the poster child of sea level rise and flooding from this past winter. And, you know, when President Biden flew in and did his press conference, that was the backdrop of the press conference. Um, sorry, that was a very long winded way of saying that it is fascinating and sobering to really think about how these places that what you know currently feel like they're so above water and so spared from and protected and just like that sea level rise is something that's so far off in the future and literally a season later they're underwater and the it, the sea level rise is an issue of now and not later but it's so hard to translate that sense of urgency for folks because for so many people it still feels like I mean it's it's sunny most of the time in California but then suddenly you're hit with these disasters and you asked about environmental justice. I'm sorry, I'm like, <laughs> kind of. Um, okay, it was a double question. It was a double question. And and capital, and your, your joke just kind of really grounded me for a second because <laughs> I just, I, I remember going to Capitola while I was writing the book and thinking about how iconic this community is and how it represented so much of like what it is that we're trying to hang on to in the present and how the future still felt pretty far off. And then it was just so sobering to see the back-to-back -back storms and the flooding this past winter and to see that community completely transformed by water. But yeah, as for environmental justice, I mean, <laughs> the book gets philosophical, pretty philosophical, which surprised me at first because I'm a journalist and I don't really give myself space to think that much that deeply, but my, you know, my book editor told me very early in the process that a book needed to take the reader on not just an intellectual journey, but also a philosophical journey and also an emotional journey. And we can talk about the emotional journey later, but from the philosophical standpoint, you know, it's like as a reporter, I'm so focused on the facts and the intellectual journey of the reader, and I'm focused on the science and translating the policy. But I realize that you can't write about climate change in the in a silo. You know, this is also all so related to our social histories and just kind of 
understanding the systems, political, social, economic, that got us into the situations that we are in today. And, you know, as I went on this like philosophical journey and transformation that, you know, had to take place for both the reader and for myself, and the more I started to listen and broaden the way I was exploring this issue beyond the realms of science and policy, I really started to think about, you know, what it is that we're actually responding to. You know, sea level rise is framed often as a threat that we fight, right? That's something that we are trying to go to war with and to win. But is it possible to reframe sea level rise as an opportunity to re-examine the systems that got us here in the first place, to, to reconsider and unwind some of the inequities that have been established, and to really think about and to challenge kind of these lines that we've drawn for ourselves, these lines in the sand, I'll, I'll use that metaphor again, and to think about who has been erased and who has been overlooked and who has been sacrificed, you know, in the process of drawing the lines that we have drawn today in our built environment. And so, you know, I go to all these communities that came to be because of our history of redlining, you know, communities that are disproportionately burdened with the pollution on, in our in California, and, you know, again, like so much of this is institutionalized and by responding to sea level rise, I think there is also truly an opportunity to, to break apart and unwind some of, some of these systems that have been guiding our status quo. And, you know, ultimately I really realized on a philosophical and a deep, deep, deep kind of intellectual level as well that, you know, our social history is inseparable from our land use history and how we use land is environmental history and you know as we think about what it means to plan for our future and to respond to these disasters both current and pending you know I don't think we can move forward without truly understanding some of like, truly understanding kind of our full history of how we got here and who we've sacrificed in that process and and yeah, and like figuring out who belongs to the table and who hasn't been at the table, but should be at the table in terms of planning for our future. Sorry, I'm, this is where I get a little oh, bit philosophical and we can extreme. totally that's dive fine. into specifics. <laughs> we're, uh, we're all about philosophical. We're a radio show that's really about, we're, we're here to get people thinking. And I, I really appreciate that. And in that same spirit, you, one of your scientific subjects in the book referred to, to as a guiding principle to Baba Diom, an ecologist from Senegal, who said in 1968, in the end, we will only conserve what we love. We will only, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. So how does this fit into the dynamic? Because, you know, I mean, people, I would say people think they understand the coast, but I would say most people don't understand the dynamics that are at play in the coast. Yeah, I love that quote. And I will say like, there are so many ways to interpret it. And I will, and I think the interpretation of that quote also evolves through the book, you know, on this intellectual and philosophical journey. And, and to start, you know, kind of in a literal interpretation, we don't know, we won't, we don't know what we should be fighting for what we should be protecting along our coast if we don't know what's at stake. So I think the first step one is to help people understand what's truly at stake and to help people understand that we we do have a problem, you know, but beyond that, how do we expand our understanding of like the world and our of our coast and of, the, of these dynamics and these systems? How, how do we expand our understanding in a way that, you know, helps us truly see what we should be fighting for and what we should be you know it's like like how do we learn and broaden our own frameworks of thinking in order to see our blind spots right like I think we all have blind spots we all latch on to the familiar we tend to fight for what we are familiar with and so and to go back to the kind of the environmental justice points as well I mean as a reporter I am thinking about making sure that I'm talking to everyone, all sides of the issue, right? Like making sure that everyone is at the table and then I'm talking to everyone at the table and I'm hearing all of their perspectives and I'm trying to be fair. But beyond that, I also have to think about who is not at the table that should be at the table that needs to be brought 
into the table, like brought to the table. I mean, so like, you know, I, for example, I can like, I've gone to a number of communities now that would be defined as environmental justice communities. And I go in the bumbling reporter wanting to talk about climate change and sea level rise. And the community leaders want to talk to me about life expectancy rates and the fact that all their kids seem to get asthma by the time they're in third grade. And they want to talk about how, you know, there's no green space or parks in their community. They want jobs and, you know, they don't want to talk about climate change. They want to talk about these things. And part of my job and all of our jobs is to help, you know, bridge these conversations because wanting more green space for your community, wanting cleaner air, wanting like, you know, better, like, environment to live in like those are climate change conversations and so again like we we don't know like we we don't know what to conserve and fight for and to protect um beyond what it is that we understand but i think there is so much potential to expand our own understandings of again like the world that we reside in how we fit into this bigger picture and you know what this table actually looks like and who's supposed to be at it. And I'm now mixing so many of my metaphors, but, um, but yeah, like I, I think more than anything, I hear so many people still think that sea level rise is not an issue that they need to care about, but we all have a stake in this and we all have a role and a duty to be a part of this conversation because this truly is about reimagining and reconsidering and kind of truly protecting this landscape going into the future and you know not everyone has a home along the california coast to protect but everyone has a beach that they want to go to or love to go to and and i think we all could agree that we want clean air and a healthy <laughs> and healthy communities well into the future absolutely well i think there's there's so much to um you know, for us all to work together. And, and a lot of times people don't truly value something until it's lost. So those of us who are focused on it have to have to let people know that this is that this is going to be lost. So getting back to the issue of of solutions, you you talked a little bit about beach re re sand replenishment, which has been really the modus operandi of the coast forever <laughs> with no social with no sea level rise forever. They've been just dumping, dumping, dumping sand. Okay, you know, big storm. Um, and, you know, I've seen a lot of these raising up on the outer banks of North Carolina. They they just say, well, okay, the last hurricane was, it was seven feet of rain of water in the on the island. So let's raise up the house to eight feet. I mean, honestly, this, or, or building, you know, a lower, part of the building as, as something that's totally floodable. Uh, you, you see those as stopgap measures, I'm sure. So we'll just, we'll, we'll put those to the side here. But there's also the problem with levees, earthen berms, um, channelization of our rivers and development of our coastal slows and marshes and estuaries. And these, it, you know, these estuaries, these, these marshes, that's where the, the water's supposed to go when it floods, mm -hmm. but we've built on them. We've filled them in. We've, we've created, you know, uh, the, we've created a line in the sand where it really shouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think about this balance of flood protection? Because a lot of those things are about getting the water out into the ocean as fast as possible. And so it doesn't flood all the real estate up, up river. And of course, the ecological and hydrological cycles that we're trying to deal with now. I mean, it's like, what are the time frames that we're thinking in? Because that's kind of where we're stuck, right? We're so stuck in the short term needs of our communities that it's been really hard to think about the long term. I and mean, we ch we channelized the Los Angeles River, for example, in response to a flood. <laughs> like you know decades ago and the goal of lining so many of our rivers with concrete in an urban environment is to as you said get the water back into the ocean as fast as possible but you know the reality is the water is rising and as one scientist 
kind of, I think of the aha moments and the oh my God moments in the process of reporting this book. And one of my oh my God moments was when a scientist told me the reality with climate change and water and flooding is that water is going to come from four sides. So there's the rising ocean moving inland. There's going to be lots of rain, as we've experienced in California, extreme precipitation, inten more intense amounts at greater frequencies. Once it starts raining, we're going to have rivers that are swollen and rivers that will be trying to make it into the ocean, but the ocean is pushing in. So again, where is this water going to go? We end up seeing a lot more flooding from rivers because the river is not able to move this excess water into the rising ocean. And then on top of that, we have groundwater, the, and I'm not talking about like the groundwater that's hundreds and hundreds of feet deep and like the aquifers that we're tapping for our drinking water. There's also like a layer, a very shallow layer of groundwater, like about five to 10 feet right beneath our feet. And so this is the groundwater that tends to accumulate when it rains, the soil is absorbing it. It's this just like this pool of groundwater right beneath the soil. As the ocean moves inland, as the tide is pushing inland, that fresh water tends to sit on top of salt water. So the, the ocean is actually pushing this groundwater up too. And so there's going to be water that's going to break the surface. And that's also another cause for flooding. And on top of that, you know, once the river overtops, the water is trying to go into the ground, the ground can absorb it because it's already at capacity. So again, like, especially in places where we've built in floodplains or on top of former wetlands, like water is going to go where it wants to go and where it's supposed to go. And you know, in the short term, we could build seawalls, we could build more infrastructure, we can try to pump water out, but where are we going to pump that water to? And in the case of building a seawall, which again, is still kind of the default quick win response politically and also <laughs> emotionally to try to wall off the water, a seawall is not going to prevent groundwater from rising on the other side of the seawall. A seawall, I mean, if you look at other countries that have tried, like tidal gates, for example, if you try to like block the ocean with like even a, like a giant Amsterdam, like, you know, Netherlands like gate, you know, if the river starts flooding and the river is trying to move out to the ocean, then you have you're trapping all this water on the other side of the wall. So I think yeah. I'm being kind of fatalistic here, but I think the reality is we really have to rethink our relationship to water and walling it off in one direction is not going to prevent it from flooding in a different direction. And ultimately, we have to, you know, confront the reality that we built on top of marshes. We have built in floodplains where the river was supposed to move. You know, we, the rivers don't, you know, go down one path that we force through a concrete channel. And what does it mean to reset that relationship? That's a hard question because, you know, the the lines that we have drawn i think i think often about like what is it that we're actually fighting over and a lot of it is boundaries property lines city boundaries jurisdictional boundaries and water doesn't adhere to city boundaries or property lines and so this is probably like the most radical thing i'll say it's like i i think we need to really step back and think about the world that we have built and the environments that we have built and the the lines and the permanence that we have tried to impose on these dynamic landscapes and you know are there ways to accommodate the water in a more sustainable way that will you know not lock ourselves into this continuous cycle of responding to floods and emergencies and ultimately we can keep building a wall having it be broken and then rebuilding it but at some point, we're going to really reach the realization that, you know, how much are we willing to pay to do that in perpetuity? And is it even realistic? And can we build a big enough wall to fight all of the water, not just the ocean? So, you know, thank you for bringing up river plains and marshes, because, yeah, like the when that one scientist told me, like, the water is going to come from all sides. I'm like, oh, my God, what does this actually mean? And it truly is. Like we 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 truly need to a reset in terms of how we think about what it means to live with water. Yes, and restoration of of those estuaries is a big thing. So we'll and we'll talk about that and other things after we come back after a quick break. 
Okay. Okay, so we're back. And so basically, I wanted to talk about managed retreat. You referenced it a little while back. It's a term that people really don't like. It sounds kind of scary to a lot of people. Um, you cover the case of Pacifica. It's just uh, south of San Francisco, along the ocean, where that ocean is coming. They've cemented and armored all they can, and it isn't working. The, the homes are crumbling. The roads are crumbling. The sea is taking it back. Uh, can you tell us about the concept of managed retreat? and the difficulties presented in this case and what's special what's special about Pacifica? Yeah, um, manage retreat is, I think, <laughs> it's a very uh, fraught term. It, you know, I will, my opinion here is that it needs a serious rebranding. And, you know, I, I've now gone to so many communities where, sometimes literally the mention of manage retreat will cause so much controversy and conflict. And, you know, at least two mayors that I've met have been completely pushed out or had to like completely shift their tone because of just even the mere suggestion of, of this term. And as you know, and we've been talking a little bit about kind of the language surrounding the way we talk about climate change and these warlike metaphors. I mean, retreat feels like surrender, right? It feels like yeah. giving up and managed also just feels very like not on our terms. And so manage retreat, you know, just on that level causes an emotional reaction an emotional backlash that has been so intense in so many communities, but kind of very strong clinically speaking, like manage retreat essentially is just acknowledging that the ocean is rising and it's moving inland. And we, it would be wise to move homes and roads and other critical infrastructure out of the way of the rising water before it's too late. And, you know, in many of these communities, I kind of, the binary that tends to emerge is, you know, this idea of either it's build a seawall or it's manage retreat. And it just be, has become such a black and white binary that we've locked ourselves into when we start to debate these adaptation strategies to sea level rise. But there is, you know, a lot of gray area. And I think, I mean, the ocean is moving in whether we like it or not. You know, we we were just talking about how it is pretty infeasible to fight water and to not acknowledge that water will move where it's supposed to move. And someone once told me it's either a managed retreat or unmanaged retreat. And right now we still have time to plan ahead. And so I think this idea of planning ahead and what managed retreat ultimately is, is kind of acknowledging this fact that, yes, we might not need to do something today or tomorrow, but at some point, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, something's going to have to change. We're going to have to reconfigure our built environment in a way that will accommodate these impending disasters. Otherwise, we will become the disaster. And, but, you know, how do we take those first steps from the short term into the long term when the short, when our short term interests and our short term wants and our short term political, like, interests are not in, direct translation into the long-term stuff. So I, I think like, I think that's where this conversation is now stuck. I think Pacifica is an interesting community where it really came to a head in terms of acknowledging that something needs to change at some point in the future, but also none of those sacrifices feel like they need to be made now. So this idea of like what feels fair and what feels premature and whether or not it's, you know, a lot of alarmism, like that kind of all gets played into it. And I think Pacifica, I mean, Pacifica gets hit hard a lot, you know, <laughs> by the ocean and also by the media. I feel like it's, it's become a poster child of sorts to whenever there's a big storm or the ocean is kind of really angry and there's like big swells, like the, the number of times I've seen, the, you know, the, the the news vans and the news helicopters come in to show that iconic photo of a house kind of toppling into the ocean or like well, hanging on the edges of a bluff. Pacifica, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's interesting though, because managed retreat has become really emotionally fraught in that community. And 
I mean, for me, I think it's one thing to kind of go into a community and really just like kind of start looking at all, the, listening to the opposition and talking to folks who are on different sides of the aisle, so to speak. And I feel like with managed retreat and sea level rise adaptation in general, it's it's really easy to vilify the homeowner and the property owner. And I think it's it's different when, you know, someone just can dismiss this as like a rich person trying to defend their their slice of paradise and for as long as possible. But in Pacifica, I mean, I also think Pacifica is not like a super wealthy Malibu. And I think that, you know, the homeowners I ended up talking to, I spoke to this one woman who spent her whole life saving up money to buy a fixer upper. She just, she described it as the ugliest house on the prettiest street in town. And like, what does it mean to be a, to be someone like that, who finally buys your dream home only to move in and find out that the the town, the state, the you know the neighborhood groups are all talking about this policy that might affect you know whether or not she can get a thirty year mortgage and whether or not she can get insurance and what does this mean for her home value and these are anxieties over uncertainties that are valid and I think you know rather than vilify someone who feels these anxieties and are responding emotionally to these anxieties like can we you know, not only put ourselves in someone else's shoes, but can we meet them at, like, can we put ourselves in their vulnerability? And ultimately, I don't think it's possible to have, to move forward on this issue without having everyone feel like they're being heard and to feel like they have some form of agency in managing this retreat or responding to sea level rise. And that also includes the people who are most resistant to these concepts. And I think it really begins with you know, deep listening and to really understand why someone is scared, why someone is worried. And, you know, as a reporter, I, I find that a lot of, a lot of the times, some of my first questions that someone's about to close the door on me is, you know, why don't you want to talk to me? What are you afraid of? And I think by opening conversations in that way, I think we can get to a different place than to continue to reinforce kind of all the different corners that we're shouting in. And ultimately, for me, as, as someone who's been reporting on this issue, I find a lot more commonality among folks who think that they're on different sides of the issue. And, you know, to go back to your original question, manage retreat truly is just identifying as a community what it is that we want our community to look like in the future, and then figuring out how how to get there step by step by step, while we still have time to take incremental steps rather than responding to it all at once after a disaster when everything is chaos and it feels like it's every person for themselves. So. Yeah, and a lot of what you're discussing, how we're having these conversations and, and how certain communities that are historically marginalized either through, you know, economically or their voices are not heard. Um, in California, which is unlike pretty much all the other states in the United States, they have the California Coastal Act of 1976. You, you referred to it as the people's law. The late Peter Douglas, who wrote a lot of that act, and and I had the honor to work with him for a little bit. You know, his his statement was, "The coast is never saved; it's always being saved," and that's unfortunately true. But it's also being saved as opposed to being lost, although that, that's debatable sometimes. So this is a law that gives the ability for people to be heard in a forum a body that hears it. I've, I've worked on a number of projects that where if we didn't have a coastal commission, we totally would have lost. They would have built a, a, a toll road through a park and, and you know, a major development on a wetland. So, and and there's talk of a project in, in Laguna Beach, which a friend of mine, Penny Elia, has been working on for many years uh, you know this this is a wealthy homeowner uh, it's maybe a series of owners of, of a, a behemoth house that has a historic temporary seawall and you know it's been up to the coastal commission in that forum to sort of try and bring some justice here to hear the sides what do you think of this whole process it's very imperfect but you know <laughs> it's what we have 
Yeah. Okay. And I, I feel like I should have started with this disclaimer. I tend to ramble and talk like my first draft. So it's like, I, I always tell people, I don't talk like I write. I, well, I talk like my first draft, but I don't talk like my final draft. And I'm, my writing is truly in like the self-editing and the way I talk is truly just pure chaos. And as I'm trying to find my thoughts and I go on all these kind of high level tangents, but so I will try to contain my thoughts here. I think, you know, the California Coastal Act was passed in 1976. It, it's a really unique law. The way I, you know, kind of explain it to folks is if you look at the Miami coastline and all its high rises, you know, there's the, the California coast looks so different than Florida's coastline. I grew up in Massachusetts and privatized beaches are such a thing in Massachusetts and that's just not the case in California and so you know the coastal act was passed by a voter initiative and it really set the tone on how we choose to build and protect you know the California coast and it's it essentially you know very fundamentally made the philosophical stand that the coast is this broader public good that cannot be cannot be owned by anyone it cannot be privatized and therefore it belongs to everyone you know and on top of that it's it's this legal recognition that the coast is this landscape that is truly meant to be treasured and protected and that you know wildlife and you know ecological aspects of the coast are valuable you know in addition to all of the economic and social and political needs that we have for the coast and so in the context of sea level rise and where do we go from here i often hear from folks you know where do i begin with sea level rise and when it comes to juggling the social political and economic pressures that weigh on any decision that we make along the coast and in california the Coastal Act is a great starting point in terms of providing a policy framework for how we navigate and balance these competing interests. I think, you know, depending on who you talk to, the process of navigating the Coastal Act, of getting a project or a permit or a concept through to the finish line can be fraught, but I don't hear a lot of people disputing the fundamental values of what the Coastal Act represents. And we have a framework in California to navigate that. The law was written in the 70s, so sea level rise was not really a front of mind thing back then. And I think it's a really interesting living document on and to see the Coastal Commission in its current form apply this law to planning for the future has been really, really interesting, especially in the face of sea level rise. And it's not a perfect process, but I do think it is really remarkable that the state of California does have these guiding principles that truly honor public access and, you know, ecological importance to the coast and kind of, again, understanding this framework that we do have so many things that we want out of the coast and that there needs to be a broader vision of how to balance all of those things. And so I do have faith in what the the law represents. And I think a lot of people would agree that um, it is truly a principle that defines, you know, California in a lot of ways and is so core to who we are as Californians. Yeah. And so the question uh, in Laguna Beach was about enforcement of that act. And, uh, you know, it's, see, the problem is, yeah, there's there's hassles that the landowners have to go to get to get their coastal development permit. But there's even bigger hassles of the community members who have been one on many projects to having to show up again and again um, to make sure that the that coastal act is is being followed to the letter. And, you know, you have to go through the staff and then there's the 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 commission. And it's it's really it's a lot of work and a, a lot of us are not paid or or paid, mostly not paid. So what they're doing in Laguna Beach, I think, is an example of, of well, there's there's an enforcement action to, to deal with this, this uh, seawall and this offending property. But there is the property rights that they're dealing with there. So some thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the... 
California coast is what, like more than 1,200 miles long. And the Coastal Commission is surprisingly small in staff relative to how big the coast is. So I would say the first thing I hear often is, I, I, I forget the, the, how what the exact number, but the enforcement team is like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases behind on enforcement yeah. cases. Um, and that's that's truly a shame. The To speak to Penny Alia, who um, your colleague, in Laguna Beach, she described it once to me as her, she is constantly battling what she feels like is a whack-a-mole of seawalls. She fights one seawall on one private property and then another one pops up somewhere else. And, you know, we we didn't have a cohesive approach to seawalls that I think the Coastal Commission kind of in its current form, in in the current kind of like discussions and spirit of sea level rise planning that is now kind of taking form at the state level. I think there is more of a cohesive approach to how to respond to seawall requests for property, like private property and also public infrastructure projects. But, you know, ultimately hearing Penny say like, it does feel like this like whack-a-mole of fighting these projects and these approaches piecemeal parcel by parcel along a 1,200 mile coastline that is just not sustainable. And, you know, part of it is we are still leaving this debate of what to do with sea level rise to the property owner, you know, or there's enough space and wiggle room right now for property owners to respond to the ocean in their own way without recognizing how their individual oftentimes selfish decisions can affect the greater landscape and the greater whole. And the Coastal Commission is supposed to be there to manage the bigger vision and the bigger picture. But, you know, do we have enough staff and energy and resources to do that along the entire coastline the entire at the exact same time? Like that is where the rubber does meet the road. And I think it is these checks and balances are often done by people like Penny and you in terms of just making sure that having eyes on the ground everywhere along the coastline, right? And I think ultimately it is just, there needs to be this greater recognition and awakening and understanding among more people that every inch of the coast belongs to this broader landscape that, you know, is facing immense change, but it's also supposed to change. And once again, we have projected so many of our expectations for this coastline with this underlying assumption that the coast is not supposed to move. And we are now being faced with really difficult decisions that we're not quite ready to face because we're not quite ready to sacrifice all these things that we have kind of developed along the coast that, you know, again, based on this assumption that it was supposed to be there forever. And that's just not the case when it comes to living along such a dynamic edge between land and water. Yeah. Uh, I could, I probably have ten more questions on my list, and 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 an hour's more, but we we have a limited space. Just real quick to end on a positive note. There's a case study of a marina, California, in Monterey Bay. It's a good test case for adaptation to rising seas. Can you just give us uh, the general outline of what they're doing there? Yeah. So it was really inspiring to me the folks in Marina and their small little town along Monterey Bay between Santa Cruz and actual Monterey. And again, also a very kind of working class, diverse community. There's a huge refugee community actually in Marina. And they just really stood out to me as a place that has been really forward thinking about how to live and adapt along a moving shoreline. And, you know, in in a Marina kind of from square one, there's this collective appreciation in town that I felt that, you know, the beach is truly a beautiful place that anyone in town should be able to go to. So protecting their beaches and public access has always been a huge priority in Marina. And, you know, from a policy and social standpoint, kind of stepping back, we have this tendency to talk about responding to sea level rise as this big, scary one-time action. You know, when we talk about managed retreat, when we talk about building a seawall, when we talk about all of these things, it still feels like we're kind of debating whether or not to take this one gigantic action rather than thinking about it as a longer term 
process. And that's where so many communities are stuck. But, you know, in Marina, the, you know, city council and their planning leaders, they've really been kind of acknowledging that all of this is supposed to be a process. And managed retreat, again, is like this transition from the short term into the long term. And what does that look like from a policy standpoint? So they've been developing kind of these phased step-by-step approaches to sea level rise planning that makes this transition feel a lot more doable. And not every step never, does not feel like it's this massive shift towards something else. And so, you know, for example, rather than having their debates and conversations today be focused on relocating entire properties or infrastructure away from the ocean at some undetermined point in the future, it's about, you know, building in these five-year check-ins on certain properties, for example, or kind of building in these these agreements that, you know, if this property or this parking lot starts to flood X amount of times a year, let this will trigger a conversation about what to do that is not just replacing it or building an emergency response to it. And, you know, this really starts to move away from this tendency to just kind of immediately throw money and emergency permits at a problem when a disaster happens. And I mean, this approach is going to pan out differently depending on different communities and their existing infrastructure and how built out and developed they are along the coast. But what Marina has been doing could certainly offer a really helpful starting template for other communities to study and potentially follow. And ultimately, you know, for Marina, they were like, manage retreat isn't surrender. It's just marching in a different direction. And they are truly marching in a new direction that doesn't have to feel like defeat. That is, that is impressive, a good way to uh... To end our discussion, uh, Rosanna Shaw, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, your book is really a wonderful, you know, display of different concepts, places, ideas, and and major all kinds of really amazing activists and scientists. I really appreciate all the effort you put into it. Thank you for taking the time and coming on Eco Justice Radio. How can our people follow your work? Buy your book and get in contact with you. Oh, yeah. Um, you can buy it, you know, anywhere that you get your books. I, I don't want to name Amazon, but, you know, Amazon and all the places. Go to yeah. your local bookstore. I have met so many amazing community bookstores along, you know, my journey these last few months. And Heyday Books, my indie publisher based in Berkeley, was truly the publisher that believed in this book and believed that we can, it is possible to tell a nuanced story about sea level rise that brings in social and political and economic kind of narratives as well. And truly also centering communities that often get ignored or overlooked in these conversations. And in terms of contacting me, my rosanna.xialatimes.com. I'm not really on Twitter X or whatever you want to call it today but I am trying to build community on Instagram. So find me in some form of social platform. And yeah, I am always open to hearing your thoughts. And this is an ongoing issue. I'd be curious to hear what you all think of the ending of the book, because I I knew where to begin the book with the Chumash story, but finding an ending to a book about an issue that, you know, is still waiting for the ending to be written based on the decisions that we make today was not easy. So I can promise you that's not completely depressing, but I I do hope that (laughs) your engagement with the book will continue to give, put out more hope that there is a possible different ending as we move forward into the future together. Well, thank you for that. And thank you again for coming on Eco Justice Radio. Thank you, Jack. Um, 